Is your hull too thin or is your hull too thick? Where exactly is the cutoff line that says that my hull is a thin hull or my hull is a really thick hull? Is it the fact that it measures a half inch thick, an inch thick, three inches thick? Like where is the cutoff point? Boats are of all different sizes. And as you can imagine, as if a boat gets bigger, its hull has to be thicker to support it. Like that just, that's logical. So how thick does it really need to be? And at what point did they overbuild it or underbuild it or anything in between? It's important to look at why you would want a hull that's going to be thinner. And the main reason is weight. By making a hull thinner, it weighs less because it uses less material to make said hull. If it's lighter, that means that it then performs better because it takes less effort and energy to make less mass move. So that means you put your sails up in any wind conditions. It can be light, it can be blowing like stink. The boat's gonna go because the hull doesn't weigh anything. If you have a really, really thick, overly built, heavy hull, you put those same sails up in light airs, you're just gonna sit there. You're gonna need a lot of wind to make that thing move because it takes so much more energy to make a more massive object move. So the main advantage of a thin hull is that it performs better. The main disadvantage of a thin hull is that it's weaker. It's more fragile simply because it's thinner. It has less strength to it. Now, the opposite is true with a thick hull. The main disadvantage is that it's really heavy. So it therefore takes more energy and more effort, in other words, more sail area and more wind to make that boat move. But the main advantage is that it's a lot stronger. So if you're going to be cruising in areas where you're going to have huge pounding seas, rocks, coral, sandbars, stuff like that, that you're going to bump into at some point. That you, Not that you wanted to bump into them, but accidents happen. If you have a thick hull, you'll probably survive it because the hull itself is inherently stronger because it's thicker. The advantage of a thin hull is that it's light and performs better, and its disadvantage is that it's more fragile. The main disadvantage of a thick hull is that it's slower, but its main advantage is that it's stronger. So there is a cheat code around this whole thickness and weight issue, and that is to use coring. So fiberglass weighs about 96 pounds per cubic foot. So that means that every square foot of fiberglass that is one inch thick, you're looking at eight pounds of material. Now, if you could replace the grand majority of that thickness with something that takes up the same space, but is a whole lot lighter, suddenly you now have a much lighter and the same thickness hull. Now we will talk about coring later. So if you wanna skip ahead to that part, you can just click to the chapter that'll take you to the coring. But we're gonna be starting off with solid fiberglass because that's a really good place to start with all of this. So as mentioned before, we talked about, you know, how thick should your hull be? Say it's one inch thick, it, that sounds thick if you have a 20 foot boat. But if you have a 120 foot boat, a one inch thick hull sounds paper thin. So this is where you start to wonder, well, how thick does it have to be? Now, if you wanna do a fun little demonstration at home, take a toothpick and just snap the sucker in half. It's gonna break real easily. Now take one of those halves and snap it again. And then take that little quarter and snap it again. At some point, you won't be able to break it anymore because a boat that size made out of wood that small is appropriately sized. So that's, that's how scantling numbers play in. So as the boat builds up in size, it also scales up the size that all the components of the boat need to be. So your decks get thicker, your hull gets thicker, your bulkheads get thicker, everything gets thicker because it has to in order to support a boat that size. Now the formula for this is really simple. So a scantling number is equal to your length overall times your beam times your depth of hull and then all of that divided by 1000. That gives you your scantling number. Now depth of hull is different from draft. You don't include the keel in a depth of hull calculation. So fin keel boats are really easy to visualize this on because the keel is bolted on. So you just ignore the keel and just measure from the shear at the middle of the boat down to the bottom, down to pretty much where the keel is. That is your depth of hull. On full keel boats, it's a little fudgier because you're, well, where does the hull stop and the keel start? Because it all kind of flows one into the other. So it's, 
that gets a little tricky. So if you aren't sure how deep your boat is and you just, you can't figure out the depth of hull because it's not obvious from the outside. So you measure from the inside and you'll go from the shear, which is the deck hull joint. You'll go from there all the way down to the bottom of your bilge because your bottom of your bilge is the top of the keel. So you can just use that as a calculation if you need to. We're gonna look at six different boats. Now three of them are in the 30 foot range and three of them are in the 45 foot range. So length doesn't change too much between each in this class, but the beams are different, the depth of hulls are different, and then we can look at, well, how does that slight change affect the scantling number and therefore all the measurements of the hull? Now the measurements that we're gonna be showing here are not the actual thicknesses of the boats that we're listing. The boats that we're listing have their own measurements because the builders built them to the parameters that they need it to be. Some of them are notorious for being overbuilt. Some of them are famous for being a little too thin. We're just gonna be looking at how thick or thin the hull actually needs to be at an absolute minimum. And we're going to imagine that these boats are both cord and solid fiberglass just for the examples. So we're first gonna look at them as boats of this dimension, like this size, if it were solid fiberglass, how thick the hull needs to be, and then if it were cord, how thick would the hull then be? And we can see the huge difference between the two. In the 30 foot class, we have the Catalina 30 Mark II. It's a pretty popular boat. We have the Hans Christians 33, a boat that is notorious for being way overbuilt. That sucker is just a beautiful tank. And then we have an Alberg 30, because we have an Alberg 30 and we're working on it, so why not include it in all these calculations? Now for our larger class, we're looking at 45 foot boats. So the first one we're looking at is the first 45 by Beneteau. Then we also have the Bavaria 44, which is pretty much a 45 foot boat as well. And then we have the Morgan 45 one, which is what wisdom is. So looking at the scantling number, it's important to remember that it is directly tied to the length, beam, and the depth of the hull. If any of those values increase or decrease, it directly affects the scantling number for that boat. So a change in beam, if you have a really narrow boat versus a really wide boat, you can see the, the wide boat is going to need so much more support and strength from the hull by having a thicker hull than a tiny little narrow boat. They're the same length, but the beam changed and that made a huge difference in how strong everything needs to be to support that. Looking at a change in length, if you have a short boat or you have a really big boat, as the boat gets bigger, it has to be stronger to support all the forces because you think about the forces that are applied at the bow or the stern, they're now transmitted over a longer lever arm because the, the whole thing is longer. So then just like with our little tooth stick, de tooth stick demonstration, if it's too long and not strong enough, it'll just snap. And then depth of hull, that is how tall is your boat? So for example, if you have a really, really tiny low bass boat, and it's just scooting along the rivers and there's like no depth of hull. The thing is super shallow. It doesn't need to be as strong as say a two-story Katie Krogan. Those trawlers are just massive. They have huge, they have huge top sides and a really deep draft. So they're huge, huge boats. Naturally, they're going to need a much thicker hull just to support it because it itself is so much more massive. On to the fun math part. So for the Catalina, its length overall is 29.92. Its beam is 10.83. And its depth of hull is roughly 5.33. Now, if we take those three values and multiply them, and then divide that amount by a thousand, we come to 1.73. So the scantling number for Catalina 30 Mark II is 1.73. So whenever you look at any of those formulas, you're gonna plug that number in as the coefficient and do your math from there. For the Hans Christians, when we do all the math, it comes out to 2.16. So as you can see, it's a little longer and a little wider and a little taller. So therefore it needs to have a larger scantling number because everything needs to be thicker to support that bigger boat. And then moving on to the Auberg, 
It's slightly longer than the Catalina, but it is so much narrower. There's like no beam in that boat. And the depth of haul is a little taller than in the Catalina. Being how it's so much more narrow, its scantling number is a meager 1.6. So pretty much it doesn't need to be very thick to be strong because it's so small. Now moving on to the 45 foot boats, these are a full 15 feet longer than our 30 foot boats. So right there, we know the scantling number is gonna jump. Then the beam is significantly greater on a couple of these. So on the first 45, it is 46.16 feet long, 13.75 feet wide, and roughly 6.36 feet deep. That gives a scantling number of 4.03. So it is almost double the scantling number of the Hans Christians. Now Hans Christians have really, really thick hulls, but it's a smaller boat. So that kind of tells you that they're probably going to be in the overbuilt category. Now the Bavaria 44 is 45.7 feet long, 13.9 foot beam, and roughly 6.53 feet deep. You do all the math and your scantling number comes out to be a 4.15. So it's a little shorter, but it's a lot beamier than the Beneto. Therefore, it has a bigger scantling number. Now when we move on to the Morgan, it's a really old design, so they didn't believe in making beamy boats back then, for whatever the reason was. So it's very narrow. So its length is 45.67 feet long. Its beam is 11 feet and its depth of haul is 6.52. So when we do all the math, it comes out to be 3.28. So as you can see, by making the boat bigger, longer, wider, taller, all those factors, the scantling number increases dramatically along with it. And when a boat is narrower, shorter, and more squat, they don't need that much material because they're smaller and therefore inherently don't need that much strength to support their size because they aren't that big. Now that we have the scantling number, it's time to actually use it. The formula for figuring out what the basic hull thickness is for your boat is you take the scantling number and then you cube root it because that's fun to do. And then you multiply that number by 0.25. So if you figured out the scantling number for your own boat, simply take a calculator and then cube root the scantling number times 0.25. And a little trick, if you have an iPhone, you turn it sideways and you have the cube roots and all that stuff is right over here. So that's a little, a little way to get around the, the confusing math that you're about to get into. <laughs> so for the Catalina, its minimum basic hull thickness comes out to be 0.3 inches. So about 7.6 millimeters. So it doesn't need to be a very thick hull. The Hans Christian being a slightly bigger boat than the Catalina therefore needs a slightly thicker hull, and its hull needs to be about 0.323 inches thick, or 8.2 millimeters thick. Now that's the basic hull thickness. The Auberg being a tiny little narrow boat and doesn't really have a big scantling number, it only needs 2.93 inches, or 7.4 millimeters. So it needs a very thin hull, and it's strong enough. And this is a good way to verify that. So you can run the numbers on your own boat, and then if you have any core samples from your boat, you can see how thick it is in different areas and then extrapolate those numbers to figure out, is your boat overbuilt or underbuilt? Now the basic hull thickness is just a generic, here's your hull thickness number. It's not really the hull thickness in any particular point because everywhere else on the boat is a percentage of that number. So the same way your scantling number is the coefficient to do the math to figure out the stuff. Once you have your basic hull thickness, then you add percentages or take away percentages from it to build the boat appropriately thick for different areas. So on your top sides, they don't have to be that thick. Adding weight there is just adding dead weight. So they can actually be 15% thinner than your basic hull thickness. Now you go below the waterline. It needs to be a little thicker because there's more chance that you're going to bump into something underwater than above water. So therefore, it needs to be about 15% thicker than the basic hull thickness number. And then when you get down to the keel, that area needs to be really, really thick, the keel region of the hull, because it's taking all the torque from the keel. And we've talked about it in the past in a video about fin keel versus full keel. 
And we talked about how the keel joint of a boat can crack, especially on a fin keel, because you have a lot of force on a tiny surface area. So that area needs to be really, really robust to make sure that it doesn't break. So it's not saying that fin keel boats are weaker because the keel's not attached properly. That's not what I was getting at in that video. What I was getting at is that that part is under a lot of stress. And this is the math to figure out how thin it can possibly be to be strong enough to take that load at a minimum. And if it's not up to snuff or if it exceeds it by a bit more than the designers expected it to, then it can crack. So the keel region of your boat needs to be 50% thicker than the basic hull thickness. That's a lot thicker. So if your boat's say one inch thick, that's what it has to be. Down at the keel, it has to be a minimum one and a half inches thick. So looking at our Catalina, our Hans Christians and our Auberg again, below the waterline, the Catalina now needs to go from 0.3 inches to 0.345 inches. So it gets a little thicker. And then down at the keel, it needs to be 0.45 inches. So almost a half inch thick. The Hans Christian was 0.323 inches thick. You go below the waterline, it now needs to be 0.371 inches thick. And for the keel region, 0.485 inches thick. So also almost a half inch thick. The Auberg started off needing to be less than a third of an inch thick at 0.293. Below the waterline, it now needs to be 0.337 inches thick. And down at the keel, it has to be 0.440 inches thick. So it gets a lot thicker as it gets down there. Now with our bigger class of boats, with the first 45, it needs to be 0.398 inches thick or 10.1 millimeters. That's the basic hull thickness. When you go below the waterline, it needs to bump up from 0.398, so almost 0.4, to 0.458. And then down at the keel, it needs to be 0.597 inches thick. So it, it gets really thick really quickly down there because it has to. On the Bavaria, much bigger boat, bigger scantling number. Its basic hull thickness was 0.402. When you go below the waterline, it jumps up to 0.462. And then down by the keel, it needs to be 0.603 inches thick. So these are getting up there. And then on the Morgan, its basic hull thickness is 0.371. Below the waterline, it bumps up to 0.427. And then down at the keel, it kicks up all the way to 0.557. Now that's the absolute minimum thickness that the boat can be to be structurally sound for its size. That's if these boats were solid fiberglass. Now, some of them in this example are, and some of them have cores. Now, we're going to imagine that all of them now have cores, and we're going to figure out how thick does the boat need to be if it has a core. You take your basic hull thickness for solid fiberglass, which was where you take the scantling number, cube root it, and then multiply that by 0.25. You're going to take that, and now you're going to split up your hull into three different layers. You have the outer skin, the core itself, and the inner skin. The outer skin needs to be 0.4 times the basic hull thickness. The inner skin needs to be 0.3 times the basic hull thickness. And the core is 2.2 times the basic hull thickness. The amount of fiberglass that you're gonna be using ends up only being 70% of what it would have been if it were solid fiberglass but it ends up being so much thicker because it has the core in there. So when you hear people say that a boat is stronger because it's solid fiberglass, that's not actually true. A boat is stronger because it's thicker, but if that same hull thickness was done with a core, it would be just as strong and so much lighter. So if you have a one inch solid thick piece of fiberglass, and that is the hull thickness, it's one inch thick and solid glass, that is really strong and it's gonna weigh a ton. It's gonna to weigh about eight pounds if you have a square foot of this thing. Now you take that same one inch thick and you have you know, a tiny outer skin, a tiny inner skin, and then you know, close to an inch of core inside there. It's gonna weigh barely anything and be just as strong. It's, it's amazing. Now you might be wondering, why not just core everything? Why are boats ever made out of solid fiberglass when you could make it just as strong with so much less weight and have all the advantages of a lighter haul without all the disadvantages of the extra weight from being a thicker haul. Well, the reason is when you're buying a boat or selling a boat, the 
key point that the surveyor is always worried about is the core. If the core gets wet, it can rot, it can delaminate, it, it can have all sorts of problems. So if you have a core, you now have a source of problems. If the boat has a solid glass hull, there is no core, therefore it can't have core problems because it doesn't have a core to have problems with. So that's, that's kind of the rationale. So you'll see a lot of boats that water gets in there somehow, and then the core rots. And then now you have a big, big mess. And sometimes it can actually be the end of that boat because it's, it's more expensive to fix the core than the boat is worth. And sadly, then that boat dies. Ah, it's a huge struggle there. So you, you can make them lighter, but then they might not last as long as if they are just solid glass. Now, coring doesn't only exist as one single material. There are a bunch of types of core. There's foam cores, there's polyurethane cores, there's wood cores. There's all sorts of different types of materials that can be used as the core. Even air cells, which is pretty awesome. Talk about lightweight. But each one has its own problems. It has its strengths and it has its weaknesses, just as everything. Boats are just a collection of compromises that happen to float. And as long as you're happy with the compromises that you've made, you're gonna be really happy with your boat. Let's look at our six examples if they had cord hulls. So the Catalina, if it were cord, the outer hull would be 0.12 inches thick, the core would be 0.66 inches thick, and the inner skin would be 0.09 inches thick. So the grand total is 0.87 inches. So if it were solid fiberglass, it was gonna be 0.3 inches. As core, it would be 0.87, so much thicker, but not much heavier. With the Hans Christian, it was going to be a 0.323 inch thick hull at an absolute minimum. That's the basic hull thickness. If it were cord, it would come in at 0.937 inches. For the Auberg 30, its fiberglass minimum thickness is 0.297 inches. If it were cord, it'd be 0.850. So as you can see, they get a lot thicker, therefore a lot stronger, but not by adding much weight. Looking at the Beneteau and the Bavaria and the Morgan, with the Beneteau, if it was a solid glass hull, it would need to be 0.398 inches thick. Cord, it would come in at 1.154, so a really, really thick hull. The Bavaria needs to be 0.4 inches, 0.402 inches thick if it were solid glass. And then if it were cord, it would be 1.166 inches thick. And then the Morgan needs to be 0.371 inches thick if it were solid glass. But by being cord, it would be bumped up to 1.075 inches thick. Now, that is a really, really thick haul for these boats. And it wouldn't add that much weight by being cord. Now, as you know, some of these boats are cord and some of them are solid fiberglass. The ones that have cores are all the high performance ones because they get the necessary thickness that they have to have without the added weight. So then they weigh less and then they can sail faster and better compared to the ones that don't have cores in them and are solid fiberglass. And those boats are notoriously heavy, heavy boats. They have a solid fiberglass hull and no core. So in order to get the strength, they go for the weight. So I'm curious to know the thickness on your own boat and how does that relate to the calculated minimum thickness based on these scantling numbers. So let us know in the comments down below any areas that you've drilled through your boat and measured to see how thick it is and how thick was it in comparison to how thick did it need to be. Now there are also all these new gadgets which are pretty awesome which digitally sound your hull and can tell you how thick your boat is. But I mean, nothing beats an actual hole and a tape measure. That's like the gold standard for how thick is it really. But if you don't want to do a destructive test, and I do not blame you, there's many, many options to figure out how thick your boat is without doing any damage to it at all. So let me know in the comments how thick your boat is, and do you wish that it was heavier or lighter, or you know, what would you rather it be? And are there any changes that you would want to make to your boat to make it better or to make it your dream boat? Let us know down in the comments and we look forward to seeing you in the next video.
Thanks for watching this episode of Sailing Wisdom. Don't forget to like the video, share it with your friends, and hit subscribe so you don't miss the next Rigging Doctor episode. And if you're interested in even more Rigging Doctor awesomeness, consider becoming a patron to see all of our extras. Can't wait to see you next time as you join us out here on the high seas.